Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to worship. This evening we begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Opening hymn for this evening is hymn number 394. 394. side cover of our worship bulletin as we join together in the confession of our sins according to Martin Luther's evening prayer. In the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. My Heavenly Father, I thank you through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, for graciously keeping me through this day. Forgive me all the sins that I have done against you, and graciously keep me through this night. I commend my body and soul and all things into your hands. Let your holy angel be with me, so that the devil may have no power over me. Amen. Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue in the hymn of praise.
Larry and Troy tonight is taken from Psalm 111. We join together speaking it responsibly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. Let us join our hearts together in prayer. Lord God, in wisdom and power, you made all things, as well as each of us. We thank you for all the blessings you have showered upon us, especially the forgiveness of sins found only in Christ, the second Adam who came for us. We praise and thank you, O Lord Jesus Christ, and ask all these in your holy name, you who live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. We now begin the first uh, Sunday in Lent as we focus now upon Christ's uh, sufferings and what he had to do to save us all from our sins. And the Apostle reminds us that he is the second Adam who was to come, who would, as that seed of the woman, the descendant of the woman, save us and the whole world. We begin uh, reading from the book, uh, the letter to the Romans, the fifth chapter, beginning at the twelfth verse. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people, because all sin. For before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, Adam, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all people, <clears throat> so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, Jesus, the many will be made righteous. Here ends our epistle lesson. Our psalm for the day is taken from portions of Psalm 32. We begin by singing the refrain. <laughs> against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin, Selah. Therefore let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Rejoice in the Lord, and be glad your righteousness.
Our gospel lesson for this evening is recorded in Matthew chapter 4, beginning at the first verse. Please rise for the gospel lesson. Chronologically, this account this uh, took place right after Jesus' baptism. But traditionally, it's the gospel lesson for the first Sunday in Lent. So it is the temptation of Jesus, we read. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain, and showed him all the king kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. Here ends our gospel lesson. We now join together in confessing our Christian faith according to the explanation to the second article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and a condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his innocent sufferings and death that I should be his own, and live under him and his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, even as he is risen from death, lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. Please be seated. We now continue with our sermon hymn for this evening. Return to hymn 556. 556.
peace be to you from God our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. The text for our meditation this evening is our Old Testament lesson, also the traditional uh, Old Testament lesson for the first Sunday in Lent. We read uh, from Genesis chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to care for it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, or if you eat of it, you will surely die. Now the serpent, serpent was more crafty than any of the other wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. These are the words of our Lord. In the name of our Savior, dear Christian friends. You know, there's a probably this phase in every uh, toddler's life, which you could almost call the why phase, you know? All these why questions. Why is the sky blue? Why are carrots orange? And tons of other why questions can be asked. And a lot of times when such questions are asked, especially about nature and, and things like that, well, a Christian parent could try to talk about the science about the, how the light is refracted uh, on the dust in the atmosphere, and that makes it look blue. But it's a lot easier for a Christian parent to just simply say, that's because God made it that way. And they're correct. They're correct in saying it's that way because God made it that way. But then there's also other why questions that you can't give that answer. A child may ask, why did our dog, why did our goldfish, why did our cat die? Or even more importantly, the child may ask, why did grandpa die? And under those questions, you can't say, because God made it that way. Because that isn't the truth. God never intended either human beings or any other uh, living things to die, but rather that is a result and a judgment that came from sin itself, and which the Lord warned them very sternly against, if you eat of it, you will most certainly die. So tonight, as we focus on the fall into sin here in Genesis chapter 2 and 3, we want to be reminded that sin destroys and ruins God's wonderful creation. And God's careful and wonderful creation was made so well for us and created for us. But then sin rears its ugly head and commits treason against God, treachery, rebellion, and, and literally spite. Because God's either holding out or he's being mean, doesn't want us to have fun, 
And so it accuses God of not caring or loving. But then finally, notice how God would pay for our sins, and he would save us from the ruin and destruction that we would have brought upon our own heads. We're told that on the sixth and the last day of creation, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. This last creation was different from all the other creations. Because for everything else, God said, let there be. And there was. With one simple line, all of the stars in the sky were put there by God's almighty word. For as many animals as there are, there are God put them all there with the simple sentence, let there be. Same with all the different kinds of uh, plants and ve vegetation we can imagine that we see here on the earth. And yet, then suddenly, for the very last creation, the crown of God's creation, the human beings, God suddenly took a very personal and very caring way, almost like a potter with clay. He fashions the man from the dust of the ground and then breathes into his nostrils the breath of life and the man becomes a living being. Now, as the Lord creates the human being, the first one, there, there's also something we should know. And that is, when, he, when it says he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, there's that Hebrew word, breath, nephesh, which also is used throughout the entire Old Testament for the soul. And so God gave human beings an eternal soul, which Solomon speaks of in the Old Testament. God has put eternity in the hearts of mankind, but they have not perceived it. Doctors can't find a soul, but God says he gave everybody an eternal soul. So that is completely different from all the other creations prior, of all the other creatures. And then his dedication and care and his wonderful creation for mankind didn't stop there. He goes on. It says, the Lord God had planted a garden, also called paradise, in the east in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. You know, right now, if you want to beautify your homes, you might think about putting flowers around the house. But you can't do it right now, right? Weather, weather permitting. So about all we could do is start to plan for spring right now. We might even plant some seeds right now and get the seeds going so that we can plant them in a few months or whenever we uh, plan to do that, or our vegetables and the like. And yet, here's God giving them this awesome place of a home, uh, a botanical garden. And then on top of it, the Lord added something to this. He says, and God, the Lord God made every tree grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge and of good and evil. And he also gave them tree-ripened fruits. You know, uh, every once in a while, uh, as a family, we've been able to head south in the spring, maybe during spring break. And when you get down in the south, a lot of times the magnolia trees are in bloom. And I mean, they're just gorgeous. And then think about Washington, D.C. What is it famous for in the spring? But the cherry blossoms on the cherry trees that uh, Japan shipped over here. And it's just a beautiful sight. So imagine this gorgeous place that God made as a home. Just awesome. And then on top of it, uh, one time I went down to Florida for spring break with one of my classmates. And they had an orange tree right outside the back door. So in the morning for breakfast, you would just go out and grab the oranges that fell that night to the ground, and then you juice them. I have never had orange juice that good as then. And this is what Adam and Eve had in this awesome place that God created for them. So what a wonderful place he had ready for them. And then that tree of life. They have a, a, a fruit in that tree of life that they will eat from and live forever. Then the Lord God also gave them work. And in the freedom of, and sinlessness of the creation, work wasn't going to be a chore. And 
he says, do whatever you want to do with the garden. The Lord didn't come down one day and said, you put the rose garden there. He didn't, he gave it to them. They decide if he wanted something there or that, they could work it, tend it however they want. And it was theirs. It was theirs. But then the one command, the Lord gave them an opportunity to show their love for him by not doing just that one little thing. Don't eat from that one tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of knowledge, good and evil. So the Lord had laid out things just beautifully for them. But now sin comes in, and in its treachery, and its arrogance, and its spite toward God, sin looks at God and questions what he does, and second guesses him, and then decides, I know better. And that's exactly what happened in heaven to start the whole ball of wax. The Bible clearly tells us that the devil led a rebellion in heaven sometime prior to him coming and tempting Adam and Eve. And sin is always stupid. Sin is always dumb. Sin is always foolish. Our own personal experience. How many times have we said, oh, why did I do that? You know, and we may even say to ourselves, boy, was that dumb. Well, would the Lord allow an angel, a created angel, to overturn him and take over in heaven? And yet the Bible tells us that the angel, archangel Michael, led the fight against the devil, and they were thrown, he and his evil angels were thrown out of heaven and, and banned. And then comes now the temptation. God gives us an eyewitness account of the arrogance, the treachery, that is, and the spite that is sin, and that is brought against God. If we look at the temptation that Satan presented Adam and Eve with, it's very much like temptation today. It's not much different. So, he says to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden. So now, the devil, through this temptation, wants to put confusion and doubt in their minds, and then paint God in this really bad, evil light. Boy, God doesn't love you. He won't let you eat from any tree in the garden. So he's setting them up. He's setting them up for a fall. And he's painting God as this meanie. And then he goes on. Eve answers the devil. We may eat fruit from the tree, but God did say, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. Uh, we, the Bible is silent uh, if Eve was exaggerating here, or if this was part of the command. We don't know. We, we can't. I tend to think she was exaggerating. Um, because God did t tell them to work the garden and take care of it and tend it. And would there ever be a time where the tree of knowledge of good and evil need a pruning? Uh, so logically, it doesn't, to me, that doesn't seem like that would be part of the command. You just can't eat the of the fruit of that tree. And then comes the big bald fish lie. You will not surely die. Because God knows that when you eat of it, you'll become just like God, knowing good and evil. So now the build-up. And it's going to be awesome if you eat from that tree. It's going to be good for you. So, the big lie by the devil. Now, Eve doesn't consult with Adam. He's standing right there. She decides that her relationship with God is not that important. And whatever God told them really doesn't apply here. And so she took some and ate it because the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom. So she thought, ah, this will be good for me. And then on top of it, she gave some to her husband and he ate it. Boy, were their eyes opened. They had never known shame. They had never known guilt. They were sinless. They were perfect. You know, how many times, could you and I even count how many times we felt guilty 
in our entire lifetimes? Can you imagine trying to come up with that number? And how many times we probably should have felt guilty and didn't, and thought we got away with it. So you can add all those up. They had never, ever had that before. And suddenly their eyes are open, so much so that they're ashamed of their bodies because they go, oh, we're naked. And now they need coverings. So life on the earth has suddenly become tainted and ruined, and now they're going to die. Now, sin is pure arrogance, treachery, rebellion, spite towards God. And sin always brings ruin and destruction. I'm going to use one more example just to drive this home. And it, it applies to our society today. Note how the Lord said at the beginning, He created them male and female, right? And look at society today where we have some wicked people teaching kids, young kids, that, oh, you don't have to be what God made you to be. You can choose which gender you want to be. And then on top of it, we got some wicked people in the medical community mutilating, maiming, chopping up, uh, wrecking and destroying young kids by trying to make them something that God did not make them, to make them the opposite of what God made them. Again, sin always destroys, wrecks, and ruins. So for those poor kids who are being rushed through medical changes to change your gender, you'll, you'll hope and then you'll pray, what are they going to have to experience later on in life because of what was done to them by people who should have been uh, known better. So sin destroys wrecks and ruins. But now, notice, the, the important fact of the whole matter is God would pay for sins and save us from the ruin and the destruction we would have rightly brought upon our own heads. In the, in the beginning, you know, it was pointed out that a lot of times kids will have this why phase. And we could ask, well, why did God choose this way to save mankind from their sins? We can ask that why question all day. But it, the answer we can simply say is because God made it this way. He decided... He told Adam and Eve right at the beginning, I'm going to send my son, the seed of the woman, who will crush the serpent's head, and who will have his uh, uh, heel bruised in the battle. And, and Jesus did suffer greatly. But notice, he saved us from the full effects of sin that we committed. First of all, God showed us more love by sending his one and only son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus. And, you know, not only should we have died, all died, but the Bible held out also one other uh, warning. The soul that sins is the one that will die. So not only do we have physical, earthly death, the Bible is very clear that there is also eternal death and hell. And if, if it weren't for God stepping in and saving us from the ruin and the destruction of sin, we would have all landed up with also eternal death and hell. So God stepped in and took that punishment away. And notice how Jesus, through Jesus, our substitute, who hung on that cross, and as we now will focus on this entire Lenten season, on how he suffered and died in our place, notice what we should have been forsaken by God in hell, God forsook his own son, Jesus, on that cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus never did anything wrong. He kept every law perfectly for us, and then he paid for all of ours. So, notice also another wonderful result, how God turned the ruin and destruction of sin into something that actually is going to be awesome for us. He took death and just simply made it a doorway. Jesus says, because I live, you also will live. And uh, where are we going to live? We're going to live in this awesome place that is called paradise. Paradise was lost in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And paradise is found at the end of all time, as Revelation reminds us. And 
we're going to be able to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God, the Bible says. And what is paradise going to be like? Ain't going to be like tonight, and it's weather. Um, in fact, the Bible says the streets are going to be paved with gold and diamonds. Snow is nice when it's sparkly, you know, and the lights are shining off of it. Command you know, streets in heaven, gold and diamonds, and how awesome it's going to be. And then the things that we are so accustomed here to because of the ruin and destruction brought about by sin and the death that everybody has to go through, that won't be there. No more sin, no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain. God's gift to us in his eternal kingdom. And just as God prepared a home for our first parents, notice what Jesus said he's preparing for us in his heavenly kingdom. A mansion, a room, an awesome place that will be ours forever. And nothing's ever going to wreck it. Nothing will ever ruin it. And this is God's gift to us in his son Jesus. So as we continue in this Lenten season, may we continue to grow an appreciation of all that God has done for us. All the stuff, he, beautiful stuff he put around us. And despite sin being in the world, man, look at all the wonders in the world around us. There's so much beauty in the world. And when our plants are able to be outside and the flowers blooming, look at all that stuff that's pleasing to the eye, good for food, the tomatoes out of the garden, and all that great stuff that God gives us. And yet the best is yet to come. Through Jesus, you and I have eternal life in the paradise of God. And may we continue to share this good news from God with those who don't know about this awesome place that he's preparing for us. So that they too can be with us in the paradise of God through faith in Jesus. Amen. May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep and guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We turn to the middle of page 7 in our worship bulletin as we join together in the two hymn verses there. sufferings and death. We thank you that you fought so perfectly against all the temptations we faced. And more importantly, that you also, you yourself, made full payment for all of our sins, for all the times we failed to say no to temptation, and that we gave in to sin. Help us who have been clothed now with your righteousness and holiness to continue to live our faith and to let our light shine as we reach out to others around us who are also dealing with shame and guilt and ruin from sin's destruction. Help us point people to Jesus and to the eternal salvation he has won for us and is preparing for all those who trust in him. Grant that, O Holy Spirit, we give, be given strength to continue to willingly fight against temptation and to use God's word, that sword of the Spirit, in our daily battles in fighting our good fight of faith. We ask this all in the name of our Jesus, our Savior, who has also then taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. We close tonight with our closing hymn, which is uh, hymn number uh, 861, and we'll join together in the last two stanzas, three and four.